طلة جديدة بتجمعنا مشاهدينا من برنامج سفرة مع سفير برحب فيكم أنا جوال جولتنا لليوم هي البرازيل وبهالمناسبة بيسعدني استضيف سعادة سفير البرازيل في لبنان السيد باولو كورديرو بونديا بونديا جوال Your Excellency first thank you for being with us here today in Mariam TV Plateau it's really a great honor for us to host you for me it's uh, alegria. Thank you. Alegria means joy and happiness. Joy and happiness. Thank you. And uh, this is same. Uh, we feel same. Uh, mm -hmm. It's our great alegria, joy and happiness to have you here. Uh, Brazil is the largest uh, fifth uh, country in the South America and it's very big. We want to start uh, seeing the country on the geographical map the surrounding uh, neighboring or uh, neighborhood countries uh, and uh, then we're going to talk about uh, the flag of the country mm -hmm. symbols colors very good the official language uh, perfect brasilia uh, the capital and so on yes uh, brazil is first of all a very large country it's a country that uh, we inherited from our ancestors it's 4,000 kilometers north to south and 4,000 kilometers east to west. Wow. So it's largest than Europe, mm -hmm. uh, if you take out the Russian Federation. You see the map that uh, we are above the equator and very to the south of the equator. The fifth largest country in the world. In the world. Wow, amazing. And this is because South America also is a very large continent. Mm -hmm. And we share borders <laughs> with 10 other countries in South America. So we have in the south the Republic of Uruguay. Okay. Then we have Argentina. Mm -hmm. Then we have Paraguay. Okay. Then we have uh, Bolivia. Mm -hmm. Peru, that we share the Amazon with them. Mm -hmm. We share a part of the Amazon with Colombia and Venezuela. Okay. And the three former European colonies of uh, Guyana, now the Republic of Guyana, the former Dutch Guyana, that is now the Republic of Suriname. Mm -hmm. And we still have the French Department of Guyana, north of Brazil. Spoken French language, you mean? They speak French in Guyana, they speak Dutch in Suriname, English, in uh, the Cooperative Republic of Guyana, and all the other seven neighbors speak Spanish. Amazing. So Brazil is, uh, we say there, a miracle. Why? In the sense that uh, we were, when we got independent, mm -hmm. 19 colonies. 19 of colonies all over of the port Of the Portuguese. Wow. And uh, by a historical accident, we turn it to be one single country. Amazing. And that is uh, a part of uh, what makes me happy to be here at the Marian TV. Because uh, ladies had to do a lot of what we are. Wow. The Portuguese arrived in Brazil, sailors coming from Lisbon, not trying to find Brazil, but mm -hmm. to go to the Indies mm -hmm. to uh, find spices. Amazing. And uh, they went a little bit too to the east, trying to get the winds. Big explorers, we can yeah. see that. So they wanted to go around Africa. Yes. From uh, the north to the south. And they knew that your ancestors Mm -hmm. the Phoenicians working for an uh, Egyptian pharaoh, Neko, yes. had done uh, the opposite from the Red Sea to the columns of Hercules, what's now Gibraltar. So they knew that someone had gone around Africa before mm -hmm. and they wanted to go around Africa to go to India and then they found Brazil. And they stepped into Brazil. They stepped into Brazil. And they, uh, they embarked upon this miraculous they, country. They found... Uh, Can't we say that? There is a letter from a gentleman called uh, 
pero vais caminha. That was the, the escrivão, the writer of the fleet. And he found naked ladies there. Why? Because the Indians of Brazil, mm -hmm. they didn't dress. Mm -hmm. They lived like in a state of nature. Wow. And people thought, is this the earthly paradise? <laughs> Which century almost? That was in the 1500s, in the year... 1500s. We, Brazil was touched by the Portuguese first time on the 22nd of April, mm -hmm. 1500. Indigenous inhabitants. And they found there tribes that lived uh, naked. And, uh, and how they developed uh, themselves uh, they throughout history. The, the first thing, the Portuguese were not, not very much interested in that land of savages. Mm -hmm. And uh, they left some uh, people there to understand the language. Mm -hmm. Some of them married the two daughters of the principals of the land. Okay. So we have uh, three very important ones. Paraguaçu, in my hometown, okay. and Bartira, in what's now São Paulo, that started uh, something that Brazil is now, this big mixture of peoples. This so is an extensive pool. We started as a mix of Portuguese men, mm -hmm. there were no ladies in the ships, unfortunately, and, and Indian <laughs> ladies that uh, <coughs> in the beginning gave uh, uh, to these half-breeds that we are all. Mm -hmm. Then we came uh, to be a colony that produced sugar. Okay. You see around the middle of the coast in the map, uh, the city where I come from, the city of Salvador of Bahia. Main sugar producer. That is the first capital of Brazil. Mm -hmm. And the Portuguese created there a city to be a fortress in order to hold, because when Brazil was discovered, 20 years later, the French started to appear, mm -hmm. because we started to produce something that was precious in Europe, mm -hmm. very linked to what Lebanon was, red paint for clothes. Wow. It, you remember that your exactly. Phoenician exactly. used to produce a purple. Exactly. And then the Portuguese had to guard that colony. And they also worked as a big explorers. The Spanish were trying to go to the west, mm -hmm. or to, to India by the east, in fact. So Cristóforo Colombo exactly. found Americas some years before the Portuguese from Brazil. That's why we say Americas, the because first largest uh, country because of the Because of an uh, uh, Italian explorer okay. called Amerigo Vespucio that worked for the Portuguese and later to others. And the continent that Columbus found was named in the honor of this Italian adventurer that worked both for the Portuguese, for the Spaniards, and later for the French, I think. And can't we see a big movement uh, of, uh, uh, of people and inhabitants uh, stepping into the country? Very much, because there was almost an invasion of the Americas mm -hmm. by the Spaniards, <coughs> the Portuguese, the British, and the French. And that's why we have this mixture, big mixture of uh, language. Yeah. Too. And then all of them, there was something terrible that happened. Which is? Germs. Uh -huh. Germs came and decimated the Indian population mm -hmm. that didn't have uh, the biological defense against, for example, a flu. Jesus. And then they brought Africans to work as slaves mm -hmm. in uh, the fields, basically of, in Brazil, of sugarcane, in what's now the US, in cotton. and uh, in the Antillean or Caribbean colonies of France, Spain, and Britain, and the Dutch. And how did they fight against and these And they, for 200 years, we had slaves there. Millions, millions of Africans went, brought 
from Africa to those places. It was an open gate for slaves, you mean? Yes. For it was a years. terrible traffic of human beings. Thousands, millions died. But what happened? Brazil today is a country of 210 million inhabitants. Wow. A hundred million have African descent. Okay. Most of us have a Portuguese or European component. Blood component. Yes. <laughs> we are mixed people. Yes. Most of us have uh, an Amerindian blood component. Wow. You... Multinational. Very Your multinational. Excellency. But you see, in this, <laughs> in this place here, that I'm very honored to be, you said that you're going to speak about our flag. Yes. And our flag is very known in Lebanon because the Lebanese love Brazilian soccer, Brazilian Perfectly football. True. Perfectly true. When I was preparing myself to come here. Because Brazil is, fa is famous. They showed soccer. me so many Lebanese with the Brazilian flags that I was afraid because <laughs> you love football more than I do. <laughs> but our flag is green, yellow, it's a kind of a lozenge of yellow. And in the middle, you have uh, a blue circle True. full of stars with a white band upon which is written the word uh, Orden and Progress. Why the stars? That's a very strange story. First of all, we don't know exactly, we do not agree why the colors. And uh, if you allow me to go back a little in time. Please. Uh, I spoke that Brazil is a unity because of a historical accident. Mm -hmm. And the historical accident was that during the European wars between Napoleon and all the other monarchs after the French Revolution, Napoleon put down most kings of Europe. And the king of Portugal, that was a teeny country, uh, was an ally of Britain. So when this, the French army came to take Portugal, the king listened to his counselors and said, why don't we go to Brazil? That's our big colony. And they took the fleets and went to Brazil. Okay. So when the French arrived in Lisbon, the king was not there. And the presence of the king, first in Bahia, then in Rio, that was then the capital of Brazil, served as a pooling force. Mm -hmm. That was 1808. Napoleon fell. And then the Portuguese in Portugal, they were not very happy. Because the king loved the Rio so much, he okay. could take... Uh, go to the beach. <laughs> it's true. Really? John, the Prince Regent that was crowned in Rio as John VI, loved to go to the beach. <laughs> and he didn't want to leave Brazil. And it was a very awkward situation because you had an European country whose capital was Rio de Janeiro. Really? Because the whole diplomatic corps, my colleagues, from 200 years ago. The <laughs> Russian ambassador in Lisbon, the British ambassador in Lisbon, and the Pope ambassador in Lisbon had to take the fleet and follow the king to this very strange, faraway land. land of Brazil. Yes. And the king arrived in Rio was a big confusion. There was no place for 10,000 nobles. <coughs> and forgive me to speak so much because not there was not all. a place <laughs> for the king. But then they found a little farm outside of Rio that would belong to a certain Mr. Elias that uh, we believe was Lebanese. Wow. So Elias gave to the king. See, you have my residence. And if your majesty, your, your, your palace in town is very tight, small. So may you accept my Accept residence. my gift. 
And that developed in was, unhappily, our National Museum that was burned some uh, last year, was this residence that Elias gave to the Crown Prince of Portugal that turned it to be the King John VI crowned in Rio de Janeiro and developed to be the palace, our Louvre, mm -hmm. of the Brazilian monarchy in the 19th century. And the flag is, when the king was forced to go back to Portugal, he left his son, the older son, Pedro. His oldest son. That was crown prince of Portugal, mm -hmm. Brazil, and the Algarves, Algarve. Yes. No, it's the southern part of Portugal. Because when Napoleon fell, you know, diplomats are terrible. No, so my forebears, <laughs> my forebears, the Portuguese in the big conference of Vienna that tried to reorganize the world, convinced the king that let's raise Brazil to a status of kingdom, not no longer colony. Because then we'll sit in the upper table, not in the lower table of the Congress. Yes. And then the son of the King of Portugal married the daughter of the Emperor of Austria. And when we proclaimed our independence, uh, which flag we're going to choose? So Pedro, it's a bit the son no? of the King of Portugal, had green as the colors of the, co of the House of Bragans. And his wife, Leopoldina, the daughter of the Emperor of Austria, had yellow. Mm -hmm. So one painter showed to both of them why if we put green together and yellow. Yes. And then in the middle, the new uh, scutcheon of the new kingdom of Brazil Pedro didn't want to be against his father, so he said, well, instead of a kingdom, let's call it empire. And then it was the empire of Brazil. And Brazil was a monarchy of two emperors from 1822 to 1889. And the second emperor that was a man that loved knowledge, he learned his mother was, he, she died when he was very young. His father went back to Portugal uh, to take the throne from his brother and give to his daughter. And he was left as a five years old emperor that was the son of the nation. Yes. And all these 19 colonies that were part of the Portuguese Brazil turned to be the 19 provinces of the empire of Brazil. And this man that learned uh, French, English, learned Arabic and Hebrew. Multilingual. And he wanted to come in after he, he was already a middle-aged man to know the world. And he went to the 100 years of the uh, American independence. Mm -hmm. Then he came to Lebanon and saw in Beirut, went up the mountain to Baalbek, then up the mountain to Damascus. And he found these people that was hardworking that was bright. Mm -hmm. And at that time, uh, he, was, he wanted to finish slavery in Brazil. So from a country that in our independence was three million, one third of them slaves, when Pedro II came to Beirut, were around 10 million and one million slaves. So the idea was to finish slavery, but we needed people to make Brazil populous. How did they finish? And they buy many different, uh, the, daughter, the sons and daughters of slave women were no longer slaves. Mm -hmm. And finally in 1888, there was a law that finished slavery. But we needed people to come and make this country full of uh, workers. Mm -hmm. So we said, come to Brazil. And the Lebanese responded, the Italians responded, the, the, the Germans responded. So now we are a multicultural country, but it speaks one language, Portuguese. And like a big stomach, where from the 160,000 Lebanese that went to Brazil from 18, 
1880 to 1930. We have now almost 10 million descendants. A very big uh, Lebanese community in Brazil. Well, there are Brazilians with Lebanese names. And they were so important to us because many of them now are we had a president, senators, governors, mayors, intellectuals, writers. From our ancestors. Mrs. Right? Because the Lebanese are beautiful. Thank you. And uh, they mix it. They mix it with the Indians, they mix it with the blacks, they mix it with the Germans, they mix it with the Italians, and formed this multicolored. A big diversity, your Diverse. Uh, bad cover that is Brazil. This is amazing and as uh, we see that Brazil is famous for its Lebanese community. Do you agree with me? Very much. Yes. And uh, mainly they occupy uh, which sectors? They occupy all sectors. It's imp impressive because uh, as we said Brazil is the fifth largest country in area in, in the planet and uh, 4,000 kilometers from north to south, east to west and we have the Lebanese everywhere. They were almost uh, fearless explorers. Yes. They went when we had the so-called uh, rubber boom, when rubber was discovered in the Amazon and was a very precious uh, product. And when the Henry Ford started to build mm -hmm. cars yes. in a large quantity, they needed rubber for the tires. Such rubber, exactly. So the Lebanese and the Cearenses that are a state of Brazil went to the Amazon. And they were selling goods. They could go up the rivers. You found, always found the Lebanese in the border of Venezuela, of Colombia, of Peru, opening those ways and uh, being part of this new nation. And if you go today from Foz do Iguaçu, where they have a high, big uh, Shia community of Lebanese origin, or to the south in Shui, or up to the border of Venezuela, you find newcomers. Because what I discovered here in Lebanon is that there is a constant go and come back. This bridge links this between bridge. the two countries. And uh, for example, I was astonished when I was around uh, 17 years old. Why? Because I thought the Kibi was a Brazilian. Wow. <laughs> uh, <laughs> gastronomical item. And not something important from Lebanon. <laughs> it was so natural to eat it. Do you like kibbe? Very much. <laughs> no, this is typically Lebanese. <laughs> I thought it was Brazilian, and you have copied from us. <laughs> we may add some uh, Brazilian items from the <laughs> Brazilian gastronomy, and we can make it uh, a mixture of Lebano-Brazilian one. That's true. <laughs> Your Excellency, thank you for the info that uh, you gave us uh, in the introduction of our episode. Uh, mm -hmm. We take a pause and uh, get back to you. Thank you very much. مشاهدينا بريك صغير وبنرجع لكم مشاهدينا رجعنا لكم من البريك كمان مجددا بيسعدني استضيف سعاده سفير البرازيل في لبنان السيد باولو كورديرو ببرنامج سفره مع سفير مستر كورديرو مستر امباسادور most welcome again your excellency here in uh, Maryam TV plateau uh, the knowledge that you gave us are amazing it's an extensive pool of knowledge really uh, now we're gonna talk about uh, Brasilia the capital of Brazil and we're gonna go to the Chamber of Senators uh, and the structure of the Parliament uh, mm -hmm. and of the country please well thank you very much it's always a pleasure to be here with you thank you and Brasilia was called uh, when it was thought as the capital of hope. Wow. And uh, we, we were a, co a country, as I said, 
7,000 kilometers of coastline. Mm -hmm. And uh, old Portuguese uh, chroniclers from the 16th century said Brazilians <coughs> and Portuguese in Brazil are like crabs. Why? They live by the coast. Wow. And you had this huge, when you go to Brazil, you have the beach, then you have a mountains, you go through a sea of hills, and then you reach an area that's a big central savanna. And going a little up to the north, the huge half of the country is the Amazon rainforest. During the 18th, 19th century and 18th century, invaders from other stronger European countries always came by the sea. Mm -hmm. So when we got independent, we thought we have to develop our interior. And when the monarchy was finished, uh, the Republic changed that flag, put the, the, the center with the stars, and let's say, let's create a new capital far from the, the fleets of that menace us once in a while. Far from the coastal the side, fleets, you mean? Yeah, because the British yes. fleet, the French fleet would come and say, boom, 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 boom. Definitely. And we were still a very young and not so military powerful country. So we decided to put this place, but never, nobody had really courage to do that because Rio was such a beautiful city. It was called the Marvelous City. Yes. But in 1955, a new president, Juscelino Kubitschek, decided to do that job and moved the capital to the, and center. to the center. We started to build Brasilia. Mm -hmm. We didn't even have uh, paved roads to Brasilia. So even wow. cement was taken by plane. Mm -hmm. And the first building uh, is this extraordinary building of the Brazilian Congress. To speak about it, you see the two towers, one up, that is the Chamber of Deputies. And the Chamber of Deputies represents the Brazilian people. There are 550. Each state is represented according to its population. Mm -hmm. So the state of Sao Paulo, it's over 40 million inhabitants. And you said there are uh, 19 provinces. No, it used to be 19 provinces. It used to now be. we are 26 states. Okay. Not From anymore provinces, the provinces in the empire, mm -hmm. states in the republic. Okay. And each, uh, for example, the state of uh, the smaller one is Amapá in the north by the French Guiana has five, half a million inhabitants. Mm -hmm. So it has eight deputados. Wow. And a big number. And uh, Sao Paulo, that is 44 million inhabitants, mm -hmm. has 72 deputados, roughly. Mm -hmm. In the other chamber, the chamber of senators, each state has three senators. So the Senate represents the states, and yes. the chamber represents the people. Mm -hmm. So How does it function? It functions, in my opinion, well. Yes. In the opinion of those that are in the presidency of the republic, they say too much talk. Yes. But to keep a large, huge continent together during our history was always necessary to have a lot of talk. Mm -hmm. Because talk, they are so different. Constructive talk. No, they are so different. <laughs> uh, each state has its own culture, even gastronomic culture. Mm -hmm. Uh, when I was a child, not child, 14 years old, I went to Brasilia to eat seed for the first time. It was already, the center was built, the ministries were ready. I didn't want to, I didn't thought that time to be a diplomat, because from a diplomat I had to leave my town to live in Brasilia. Exactly. But uh, uh, President Kubitschek that changed it, from Rio to Brasilia, he had been mayor of a planet city called Belo Horizonte, beautiful horizon, capital of Minas Gerais. Belo Horizonte. And he found this very creative architect in Rio called Oscar Niemeyer that has a beautiful production in Tripoli, in northern Lebanon. He, he oh, built really? things here. Oh. 
Yeah. And he's originating from Brazil, you mean? Uh, he's from Rio. He has okay. the Portuguese and, and German names. But uh, he worked with Le Corbusier, a very important uh, Swiss uh, modernistic uh, architect okay. that thrived in France. And they wanted to do simple things, straight lines. But uh, Niemeyer was a student. Then he was a colleague of Le Corbusier. They designed the UN building in New York. Mm -hmm. And then uh, President Kubitschek asked him to do beautiful buildings in his capital of the state of Minas Gerais, Belo Horizonte. And he built some extraordinary buildings. But he did something like that that's important for you. Which because it said, Le Corbusier liked the straight line. Yes. When I look at the mountains of my country and that the beautiful curves of our women. Very well tailored. I have <laughs> to change my architecture. <laughs> so he built this beautiful architecture in Brazil with that line and said the creator does not have a straight line on his creation. So we can say best line tailored architecture. Yes. Wow. And. Uh, uh, Brasilia is this capital of hope, full of modernistic buildings that were designed by the team of Niemeyer. And uh, this created a revolution in Brazil. Why? Because those people that lived by the coast had to go to the, cap the new capital. And have ha had and, to cope. Under and they mixed it more. And as I was telling you when I was 14 and went to Brasilia for the first time, I have never seen a feijoada, that utmost Brazilian dish with black beans. But this is very delicious. I've tasted yeah, it. Yeah, but in my state, we only eat with brown beans. Okay. Up north, with white beans. In the south, with black beans. Wow. So when I thought and I look at it, I said, what's a barbaric place? <laughs> and then we started in Brazil, we are mixing all our regional cuisines, from the cuisines of the Indians of the Amazons. Developing all this mixture. Uh, not only <laughs> developing, but appreciating each other's taste. And this created a more inclusive, a more integrated country. Definitely. And uh, that country that when we won the third world championship in 1970, we were 90 million people. Today, wow. 53, uh, 48 years after, we are 220 million. Amazing. And this is very important because we grew as exponential rate. But now we stop it. So in the next 20 years, we are going to stop at 250. Okay. And what this means? This means that what was quantity now is turning to be quality. Quality. And Brazil, that was a big farm that produced coffee and cocoa and rubber. Isn't it, it still under the current date? Turned it to be an industrialized nation. Okay. We invested a lot in shipbuilding. We developed planes. We have now a capacity of producing 4 million cars a year. Mm -hmm. Because a certain slump in the economy, we are producing 2.5 million. Producing and exporting uh, your uh, We excellency. export cars. We produce cars. But as we are a very big market, mm -hmm. we are more producers to consume externally. And that was the way that uh, Brazil thought itself. Now there is a revolution in the world too. Because we grew in an Atlantic North centered world, Europe and the United States. And now we have a globalized where China is growing, India is growing, Russia is reappearing, Fa Africa got independence. Countries. So we have fast growing countries. But you also have uh, a big change. Mm -hmm. I come from a new country, but I come from an old foreign ministry. Mm -hmm. 
we had uh, relations with the kingdom of Prussia. We had an embassy in Naples in the kingdom of two Sicilies because the wife of a second emperor was a princess from southern Italy. And when Rio was capital of Portugal, Macau in China was our colony. So a big, a big we diversity. have this not only diversity, but this regard, this looking at the world as something natural. Mm -hmm. So we have the world inside Brazil. As we have 10 million descendants of Lebanese, I have 30 million descendants of Italians, half a million descendants of uh, Ukrainians, two and a wow. half million descendants of Syrians, 200,000 Palestinians, 150,000 Jews, 100 million descendants of Africans. From, I have a question, uh, Your Excellency. Everybody is Brazilian. From a world perspective, yeah. how are they living? And how They're are living, they coping? I say, Peacefully, happily, no, very joyfully? Depends on how your opinion is. In political terms, peacefully. Yes. In social terms, not so peacefully. Okay. Because we were a very poor country. We got to be a much richer than we were. Mm -hmm. We had uh, a very poor infrastructure. We developed a much better infrastructure. And we have a scourge of criminality and drug trafficking that we are not able to. But I have a lot of faith in Brazil. Because when we were independent, there were no universities. In the beginning of the 20th century, we had two universities. Now we have more. Uh, 500 universities. So what when is I what is skyrocketing number? Huh? A skyrocketing number. Yes, because we invested a lot of education in education, but not as much as the Koreans. Mm -hmm. The Koreans are in front of us yes. because in this planet, what we have, it's a competition, a competition to quality, to education, to improve life of people. We improve it very much but we're still far from what we wanted to be. If, let's say 50 years ago, we had uh, a per capita income of $1,000, now we have a per capita income of $10,000, but we need to have a per capita income of $30,000. This it is the main target. It has to come through education. Mm -hmm. At the same time, when we industrialize it, when we open uh, the the frontier for producing food. Now Brazilian is a food basket of the world. Okay. But we need to keep the environment because we cannot destroy it. We had to learn, as you do here. We have to learn how to preserve how to the preserve. environment. We started using, when I was a kid, no plastic at all. Yes. Now we have too much plastic. So we have to contain the plastic. Exactly. We have to keep our beaches clean, our rivers clean. We have to recycle. We have to learn. We are recycling, but not sufficiently. Yes. We started to build industries. They started to pollute us. And Mr. Ambassador, you were saying we have to open our frontiers mm -hmm. for exporting food, you mean, because it's a big basket of for food? For uh, exporting producing? food and for other things. Like what? When we were a Portuguese colony, our neighbors were the Spanish Empire. Okay. So if someone didn't speak Portuguese well, we had to coat the throat because they were the enemies. Oh my God. Oh my God. But now we are all good neighbors and brothers. So when we have 10 or seven or nine, because we are also are friends of Chile and Ecuador, we have to do the dream of integration of South America. So now, where we had fortresses separating us from Uruguay, we have roads, railroads, uniting us. You have to do this also with Peru. We are doing that mm -hmm. with Venezuela. We have to make South America integration something like the Europeans did. Any convention for that? Many Any conventions. national or international conventions? Many conventions. We have uh, uh, Mercosur, that is our uh, joint uh, economic uh, Southern market, area. Yes, with Paraguay, Uruguay, and Argentina. 
Venezuela is a party suspended now. Uh, Bolivia is joining as uh, associate. Chile is the same. So we are building this. And uh, this is very important because we were, we speak South American, Latin American, in a certain way a continent that was in the fringes of the world. And we want to be in the center of it. What is the currency, Mr. Ambassador? In Brazil, we have a real. OK. Equival equivalent to? Uh, it is three and a half reals to a dollar. OK. Yeah. And uh, what's about uh, the poverty margins? Mm? Any poverty margins? Too many. Too, Too many. much. We were able to decrease uh, uh, the poverty from 40 percent of the population to 20 percent of the population. Which is very amazing. But 20 percent is still 40 million people that we have to raise. How are you fighting this? Well, there was a, a big effort to transfer income. Okay. The other is to stop uh, uh, the great uh, migration from the the interior to the state capitals. Okay. And the, the, even the idea of constructing Brasilia was to distribute people through the land. The third is education. A country that didn't pay much attention to primary education, now we are almost, and this is, is sad to say, 100%. Secondary education is still in uh, not satisf satisfactory. We had uh, a group of elite lycees okay. that only the elite could go in. They were public. And people who could not go to a, those lycees paid low quality private education. And the other Now we changed it. But while changing, we gave a huge number of new schools. The quality was not so good. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same thing with the universities. Brazil is doing a huge effort to produce science. To we have a national research country that puts more than 1% of our GDP into producing science. And what's about IT? It's also something that we are developing very much. Okay. But it's not satisfactory. Not that yet. is the big, not yet, it's always a fight, a constant struggle of uh, raising the quality of life of the Brazilian people. Are you trying to bring extensive pools of experts from outside? Well, we, we import and we export. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Brazil is not known to be a big exporter, but we are. Okay. At the same time, we don't have uh, too m a big part of international trade because we were a side-looking market. Mm -hmm. But we are between the fifth and the ninth economy of the world. Depends a lot on the exchange of rates. Okay. Of how our currency is measured vis-a-vis -vis other currencies. Uh, we are economy much so bigger far. than Russia. Yes. Much bigger than Russia. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we do not have the military power of Russia. Okay. Because we don't have uh, enemies. And it's difficult. Praise God. No, it's difficult to convince people to big, uh, do a big fleet. You say, why? Why to spend so much in fighter planes because uh, the neighbors really do not menace us? And this is the great problem now is to combat corruption. Yes. And this has been a fight for us. Uh, our constitution of 1988 built a force power that is the public ministry. And this young man are trying to break what were some old habits. And we see now how uh, we are doing. And I think Brazil is and has been 
for the last, let's say, 88 to what now is it, 30 years, a country that is thriving in democracy with some problems. Our politicians suffer a lot because people vote them. After four years, don't vote in them any longer. Why? We, uh, because they say you have to be better. Yes. You are good, but you have to be better. Okay. And this is something that the Brazilians are very much proud. Wow. Sometimes there are exaggerations, but I think we are, as a great German philosopher, not German, Aus Austrian, he's, he wrote in German, Stefan Zweig, Seva said that Brazil is the country of the future. Mm -hmm. Some criticisms say that the future will never arrive. It will, I believe it, it will certainly arrive. that the future is always arriving. I studied engineering when I was younger. I did my army service as an officer. I loved history. And because my wife told me, go to something that you should, I enter in diplomacy. And I speak of her because, uh, you see, more than 50% of Brazilians are women. So in this case, uh, allow me, Mr. Ambassador, to send my warm greetings uh, to your wife. Thank you. And to all uh, women, active women in Brazil. But uh, you see, we have a law in Brazil called Maria da Penha. It was a law of a lady that was beaten by his husband. And uh, Domestic violence. Domestic violence. And, was, and has, it's still a problem there. Yes. But this law permitted and we created uh, police stations for women. And when we look back to our history, we always had important women in our history. I spoke of the Indian ladies, but could say princesses. They were daughters of the caciques, of the sovereigns of those tribes. Then we had uh, from the black population that came as slaves, very courageous women that fought against slavery, like Dandara. Then we had uh, independence, one forebear of mine, Maria Quiteria, that dressed as a man and entered the, the army of Brazilians fighting against the last Portuguese. Then we had that princess from Austria that was the wife of our first emperor. She was very bright. Yes. In fact, she was the president of the state council that wrote to him saying, Pedro, now is the time that you separate Brazil from Portugal. Wow. Then we had in the 19th century writers and the 20th century poetesses, great writers and politicians and scientists like Berta Lutz that uh, in the 30s. They must have marked history. Oh, they, they fought to have the Brazilian women voting much before many European countries. Uh, she fought in the 30s to put in the labor laws that the salary had to be equal for both male and female. And what's about gender equality? And they even changed something that I don't like. Why? Because when I got married to Vera, <laughs> according to the 1916 uh, civil code, <laughs> I was the head of the couple. Well, similar, similar salary. I'm the head of the couple. <laughs> <laughs> Even she. But then the, 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 the parliament changed it. And now we are a double-headed eagle. <laughs> so <laughs> we have two heads in the couple. This is good. But so, I'm joking. So, so, Mr. Ambassador, you're against gender equality. No, I'm absolutely <laughs> in favor of gender equality. <laughs> but I said that when I was the head of the couple, I was slightly more comfortable. But this is an example of how the Brazilian women mm -hmm. fought through the political stream. stream. They are big fighters. And uh, they did uh, a change in the civil, civil codes. I remember because Vera was very much uh, militant. She would go with an uh, NGO called Cefemia in the 90s and see the she senators and see the she 
deputies <coughs> that say we have to have more. We have to make uh, this dream of equality wow. that we have since that we got independent. Because when you got independent, we have a country that had, of the three million, one million slaves. But even at that time, in our constitution of 1824, the goal, the objective, was to be a democracy, mm -hmm. was to build equality. Mm -hmm. And if all men are created equal, men and women have the same rights. For us, males, it's quite, used to be quite comfortable. Yes. See? <laughs> no change in diapers. But I changed the diaper of my third son. <laughs> How? And it was <laughs> extraordinary. Yes. I come from a generation that does not know I cook an egg and rice. <laughs> but my three sons, they are chefs. Wow. They take care of their children with such an easiness that my generation was not accustomed. Failed to do. And we had the president of the Republic, Ms. Dilma Rousseff. So Brazil now has women piloting fighter planes. Amazing. Here in my, we have this frigate within Unifil. And when I go to Nakura, I see Brazilian naval commanders that are ladies. Wow. So this is quite a change. The majority of the students of our universities are ladies. And was yesterday... That must be a great image for the country. I was trying to write a speech on women yesterday. And I found that most of scientists that get prizes in Brazil are women. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for uh, such uh, rich information again. We'll take a break and come again. Thank you. Mushaydina, break is here on the chat. من برنامج سفرة مع سفير رجعنا لكم مشاهدينا من البريك كمان برحب بسعادة سفير البرازيل في لبنان السيد باولو كورديرو مستر باولو مستر امباسادور Your Excellency Brazil is a mixture of cultural diversity music, carnavals, Rio de Janeiro, Sao Paulo, Bahia uh, cultural diversity too and so on for this part of uh, this uh, last uh, episode we're gonna cover the touristic spots of the country of the nation and then uh, we go step by se step uh, to the music uh, to discover gastronomy and so on well thank you very much speaking about tourism in Brazil it's uh, I, I get passionate with this because uh, I am from this state of Bahia where the first capital was built by the Portuguese. For Bahia was capital from 1549 to 1763. Mm -hmm. And during the so-called gold boom in Brazil, uh, we were at that time very Catholic, following uh, the instructions of the Council of Trent, mm -hmm. because the Catholics said we have to put emotion in the heart of the Catholics. Yes. And then we had this Baroque movement of Our Lady Mary standing on a half moon full of little angels. So this is Bahia. Yes. You go there, you find remarkable Baroque churches covered of gold with... Uh, Old architecture? Very old architecture. Mosaic architecture? Mm, less mosaic, but uh, uh, Baroque uh, Our Ladies, uh, absolutely amazing. And uh, old fortresses around beaches, and music from Africa, and tastes of uh, what comes from what is nowadays Nigeria, 
Benin, mixed with the tastes that the Indians developed, uh, a rich uh, plate from fish. That must be a nice string of sounds, Mr. Yes. Ambassador. You have this uh, capoeira martial art that took the world, the people dancing in the streets. Wow. Uh, the rest of Brazil say that we don't work very much. And uh, we say that's not true. And uh, we have uh, a musical tradition that you have these new pop singers of my Jonas, like Gilberto Gil, Caetano Veloso, uh, Maria Bethânia, all of them come from Bahia. Wow. But they had to go to Rio. Because in 1763, Rio turned to be the capital, because the gold of Minas used to go out from Rio. And Rio is, we call it the Cidade Maravilhosa. It's an amazing natural architecture. Marvelous of, uh, architecture. Architecture of nature. Mm -hmm. To see you have yes. the Corcovado Mountain, the Sugarloaf Mountain, and around that a city that was colonial, Turn it to be neoclassic, mm -hmm. turn it to be modern, mm -hmm. and uh, is a showcase of architecture. And they say in Rio that they have the best carnival of the world. We, must we, from, Abia, we from Bahia don't <laughs> agree. <laughs> and uh, in the north of Bahia, you have another state, Pernambuco, with two little, not little, big cities, Recife and Olinda that are also jewels of uh, Brazilian Baroque architecture. And they say they have the best carnival of the world. Lindissimo. So we have three areas in Brazil fighting during carnival time to see which is the best of the world. And who's the best? I will invite you <laughs> to be judge. Like, uh, and invite two other uh, Lebanese ladies, you'll be like those gods before <laughs> the war of Troy, saying <laughs> which of the three cities is the most beautiful. And uh, you have also Sao Paulo that thinks, thinks that is the powerhouse of Brazil. Yes. They are a big industrial city. They used to be because industry went to the outskirts but it's also the gastronomic capital of Brazil because you have uh, the best Japanese restaurants in the world, the best Korean restaurants in the world, this is the best delicious. Lebanese restaurants. You have, uh, yes, you have uh, the best uh, Italian restaurants of the world in Sao Paulo. Sometimes we go to Sao Paulo only to eat. <laughs> and uh, they have this uh, star restaurants. Even you have very good French restaurants in the world. No, you just don't have a good British restaurant in Sao Paulo. You and this is a big it. diversity and uh, mixture a mixture of gastronomy. And then you go to Paraná. Foz de Iguaçu is where a big river falls into the Paraná River. It's one of the most amazing waterfalls, much bigger than Niagara similar to Victoria Falls in Africa, and turn it to be a big national park mm -hmm. that we share with Argentina and Paraguay. Yes. And where you have a large Lebanese community. So this is a main touristic spot. It's maybe the most uh, uh, important individual touristic spot in Brazil. Okay. So going to, I cannot forget Minas Gerais because also there are those colonial cities of what we call the 18th century gold boom of Brazil. Okay. When Brazil was the most important producers of gold and diamonds. And then you cannot forget Brasilia. But if I don't mention Manaus and Belém in the Amazon, when they see this program in Brazil, they say the ambassador forgot us. Where you have uh, one of the largest rivers of the earth, where you have this huge forest, where you can go to hotels whose bedrooms are at the top of trees. Inserted in the top of the trees of the forest. Yes, and wow. when the river goes up, 
it goes 18 meters. That must be a miracle, no? Oh, it's, I, I w once I took Vera to one of them, where the king, <laughs> the queen of Spain had been. But uh, you see, it, the problem in Brazil is that is everything is far away. Yes, far distance. So it's like flying from Lisbon to Moscow. And, and what's about transportation? From well, the our, our uh, air services are very good. Very active. You can fly anywhere in the country. And what's about the local prices? Uh, the prices are not very cheap because of the distances. Okay. And the bus services are very good too. Affordable. You can go. Nowadays, uh, for long distances, air is much more affordable. Okay. So go by air because you lose less time. Definitely. Instead of spending four days on a truck, on, on a bus. When you are a backpacker, when you are younger, you might wish to go that way. Yes. And I cannot forget the beaches of the Northeast. Because, for example, Argentinians love Brazil. A coastal magic string. They go to the south. The Italians go to the Northeast because it's much closer to them. Yes. And we have, uh, we just don't have a direct flight from Beirut, but we have from Casablanca, from Addis Abeba, from all Europe, from all the United States, from Japan. So it's a country that it's a little far away. What we say is exactly the contrary, that you are far away from us. True. <laughs> <laughs> because you are the main spot. Yeah. That's Talking about uh, distance and uh, flight time, can you tell us from Beirut to Brazil? Uh, around 14 hours. 14 hours. Yes. And what's about the visas? Some uh, terms Well, you we uh, still have to have visas. It's not very difficult. It's just a procedure. It's not very expensive. Mm -hmm. I try to put my colleagues in Cinefil, where it's our visa section, to work hard. Okay. You can fill your requests online. Mm -hmm. We make an hour. And that's it. And then, uh, in order to get the visa, Your Excellency, is it easy or some higher conditions are requested? Uh, there's not uh, too much high conditions, no. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, uh, you encourage uh, the viewership and uh, you invite them to yes. go to Brazil? Yes, yes. I don't need to, to invite because you go there so often. Definitely. I, see po uh, I have, uh, for the Lebanese, it's interesting, because once I received the, the Maronite Patriarch in Brasilia, I was under Secretary General for Africa and the Middle East. And then I have at the Mount Lebanon a uh, reception at the Mount Lebanon Club. I had uh, the representative of the Orthodox Archbishop of Sao Paulo, uh, Don uh, Damaskinos Mansur. I had the Melkite Bishop of Sao Paulo. I had uh, the Maronite Bishop of Sao Paulo. Wow. I have the Sunni Iman of Sao Paulo. Mm -hmm. I had the Shia Iman of Sao Paulo. And I had the Druze uh, Sheikh of Sao Paulo. And I have a representative of uh, the uh, uh, the what they call me, my lord. Uh, the the Syrians of Rio de Janeiro, how that yes. are also uh, from the north of from, from Tripoli in Lebanon. Okay. The Alawites. Okay. So I had, uh, and I had some. Uh, All this mass. Most of them. Wow. Together, I had uh, a, a governor from the right wing party. And I had another governor of Lebanese descent from a left-wing party. Amazing. So this is how you integrate it. And you come and go. I, I give thousands of visas here. This is a perfect sample of integration. Yeah, and they, they come and go. Every yes. day I have uh, 150 people going asking for visas. Yes. And they're given. Unless you have a problem mm -hmm. uh, with uh, justice, 
that you don't have. Definitely. But the rest is we try not to be too bureaucratic. And we love the Lebanese. Thank you. We love you too. Thank you. Talking about uh, the book of gastronomy and culinary art, what can you tell us? We have the feijoada. And what feijoada. are the other main dish? Ah, we have feijoada, many kinds of feijoadas. We have the churrasco that turned to be international, but is a, a way of preparing food from the south. Lots the of meats. The component are? Meat. Only meat? Meat. Oh. Okay. We have uh, uh, the Bahian cuisine. Mm -hmm. Another day, the uh, Korean ambassador came to me. He just arrived from Kenya and said, Ambassador, I want mukeka. What does mukeka it mean? Mukeka is a fish stew okay. made with coconut milk mm -hmm. and uh, palm oil that we add uh, to an African substract, farofa. A sort of coconut milk? Yes. Okay. With cassava that is from the Americas and uh, with a lot of what were Asian spices, and we make a Brazilian plate. But this is a lot of calories intake. Uh, Don't depends. you agree, Mr. Ambassador? Not <laughs> really. It's a light fish, <laughs> but it's delicious. Okay. Then if you go to the sertão, that is the dry lands of Brazil, mm -hmm. you have a lot of jerk, uh, dried... Dried foods? Dried milk, meat, beef, Okay. Dried uh, mutton, dried goats. If you go to the Amazon. Why, uh, excuse me, why do we say dried? Dried because it was a very arid region. Okay. We didn't have at that time f f fridges. So in order to conserve food, you have to put in the sun mm -hmm. all those parts of those animals. And we, as uh, cows and uh, and. and and bulls were too expensive. We had a lot of uh, sheep and goats. And cordero too. And corderos, yes. Corderos My wife the loves lamb. corderos, yes. Yes. Lambs, yeah. <laughs> and we developed another cuisine that is from 100 kilometers out of the coast, you have the cuisine of the Sertão. And uh, if you go to the Amazon, you have something very strange that you cook fish in cassava uh, juice mm -hmm. with something called jambu. What does it mean? Jambu is a leaf that exists only in the Amazon. Yes. So when you go to the dentist, uh, the dentist posts a little anesthetic. Jambu is like an anesthetic. Okay. So you have the shrimp cooked in cassava juice mm -hmm. with jambu. It's the most strange feeling when you go to Berlin or when you go to Manaus because we start chewing that and your the flavors are strange. Wow. And then when the jambu touches your palate, it started to be slightly anesthetic. We should try, Mr. Ambassador. You should try. I have to do that. If any, the, any expert chef here in Lebanon to do it? I have uh, a lot of Lebanese ladies yes. whose forebears mm -hmm. have been in Manaus. Yes. And if the Ministry of Agriculture of Lebanon allows me, I'll try to import some <laughs> jambu to here. Wow, amazing. What else? What's about uh, the uh, We have in Minas Gerais a cuisine that is a transformed Portuguese cuisine. But you have this soup. What can you tell us about this soup? Soups? Brazilian soup, yes. I have many soups. The most delicious one? Uh, it's chicken soup, in my opinion. Yes. With rice. Assorted with rice. Canja. Mm -hmm. That was the plate that Emperor Peter II that mm -hmm. came to Lebanon preferred. Amazing. So at night he always had his canja de galinha. And that you can put a lot of spices depending on your taste. Okay. We also have uh, a delicious fish soup in Bahia that we say is better than the emperor soup. We are hungry now, Mr. Ambassador, <laughs> talking about gastronomy. You, <laughs> this is unfair. Uh, 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 my, my, my kitchen is being transformed now, but be sure that 
you have a mukeka soon. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And about the sweets, you have these ah, small bowls sweets. of chocolate and coconut. What you do we see, call them? Chocolate comes from uh, Bay. Yes. The Mexicans invented chocolate. Okay. It's a world of Nahuatl. Uh, the Aztecs reserved that to their emperors. Okay. But it came from the Amazon. And uh, we have uh, a great Brazilian writer, Jorge Amado, that Roberto Catlab says was Jorge Habib, but I'm not sure, yes. that wrote uh, many books. One of them is about this lady, Gabriela Cravo e Canela, that was married to a uh, Nassif and had this shop in Ilhéus, Southern Bahia the region where we produced cocoa for chocolate. Mm -hmm. And they produced the delicious chocolate. But they mixed that with the sweets of the sugar cane. Okay. And we have something called cocada. But it's very sugar when we taste it. Sh very sugary. Yes. It makes your teeth ache. Exactly. <laughs> oh, it's, it's the way we eat. <laughs> but the chocolate is not very sugary. We're trying to adapt it, our taste to a less uh, fattening way of eating. Yes. Then when uh, you were a young lady and you went to France to see La Nouvelle Cuisine, <laughs> where they put these big dishes, plates, with little pieces of food. Exactly. M our chefs are following suit. So now we can have a light cocada. You can have a delicious cashew, not the cashew nut, okay. but the sweet of the fruit that gives you the cashew nut. Mm -hmm. That is something amazing. Wow. And you have, uh, I have uh, in Brazil maybe 15 different kinds of mangoes, 12 different kinds of bananas, mm -hmm. uh, fruits that you have never seen in your life. A lot of dried fruits. Dried and very fresh fruits. Big basket of fresh fruits. So you can have these mixtures of what we call doses. You see, we are Portuguese speaking, the largest Portuguese speaking country in the world. Mm -hmm. But we inherited from Portugal what they used to sell, say, the sweets of the sisters. Wow. Ladies that went to a monastery or a convent. And they specialize in using uh, eggs and sugar to produce new sweets. Mm -hmm. We adapted that from in our convents to the tropical and equatorial fruits that didn't exist in Europe. At this time? At this time. They brought from the colonies in India, <laughs> mango trees, jackfruit trees, and everything grew. Even coconuts come from Asia, but now our beaches are full of coconut trees. Yes. So this thing, every little region of Brazil has a different sweet. And uh, we have this in the morning, you have things that come from the Indians, like couscous. Okay. That is an Arab As word. a breakfast, you mean? And a breakfast. Yes. With fruits. Then you have a heavy... You have your famous bread, Mr. Ambassador. We have the famous bread of Mina, that's so-called uh, uh, cheese bread. Exactly. Pão de queijo. That is made bon. of cassava and cheese. I just love this cuisine of I bread. I love it, too. Assorted with the cheese and a lot of uh, calorie intake. And a lot of calories. And you have to have your feijoada. You have to have your caipirinha. That is our national drink, even if each state has its own version. And then you have to have your dessert. And what's about your beverage? Uh, a typical Brazilian beverage. Uh, it's a kind of... Uh, uh, fire brand, okay. cachaça, made of sugar cane. 
Okay. But nowadays we are one of the largest producers of beer in the world. Alcohol based. All yeah. of them alcohol based. Yes. Very alcoholic. Oh my God. They make uh, a cachaça makes a, vod a Russian vodka. The cachaça light. is a yellowish color? No, it's white. The white. Transparent. Okay. A good cachaça is transparent. Okay, okay. I've tasted it. But then you mix it with fruit juice. Mm -hmm. To make a caipirinha, you put lime. Mm -hmm. I can use cashew, uh, fruit. Then you have the batidas. Okay. But also you are a very big producer of wine, mm -hmm. red and Reds. white and uh, champagne-like. And uh, we have a very strict driver's law. Oh my Don't God. drink and drive. Really? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, we, we have all this very varied production of uh, alcoholic beverages. And as we have so much different fruits, mixing them with fruit is a Brazilian sport. Amazing. Amazingly important, uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Ambassador, for all this uh, info that you are giving us. And by the end of our episode, what is your main or your message to our Lebanese audience? to the Brazilian audience and to the Lebanon-Brazilian viewership? Well, first, because Lebanon is a teeny country. We could have 800 Lebanons inside Brazil. But Lebanon is so diversified. Lebanon is so beautiful. Lebanon, when I go up uh, to the Becca and I see something that we don't have in Brazil, snowy mountains. You don't have snowy mountains. No, we have one place in Brazil called S São Joaquim where five centimeters of snow falls Only. every year. <laughs> People, in while when I see Lubna, well, the white. <laughs> and, what do you uh, feel, Mr. Ambassador? Uh? What do you feel? Well, I, I chose to come here. Mm -hmm. When I see these old cities like uh, Bible, Biblos, Jbeil, or Tiro, Sur, of Sidon, Saida, of Beritus, Beirut. I go back uh, to the beginning of civilization. Yes. And when I see these people that left uh, this beach and these mountains, looking for new opportunities, and that uh, gave us this wealth of talent. I see that this linkage continues. Because every year I have 1,000 new Brazilians that are born in Lebanon. Exactly. Because our legislation gave not only the old you soli, Brazilians were those that were born in Brazil, but then they can transmit. So this is the link. It's a human bridge on the Mediterranean and the Atlantic. And vice versa. The bridges you go and come back. Exactly. And uh, countries that love each other. And I just say that I'm so grateful to have been appointed ambassador of Brazil in Beirut and to have had this opportunity of uh, savoring your country and raising the flags of the true identity of both countries. Exactly. Viva o Libano, viva o Brasil. Mr. Paulo Cordeiro. Muito obrigado. Mr. Paulo Cordeiro, obrigado. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you again. Okay. And this is a great pleasure. Looking forward to hosting you again in Mariam TV Plateau. Thank you. Have Absolutely. a great day. Obrigado. مشاهدينا نحن وياكم خلص لقائنا لليوم من برنامج سفره مع سفير مع سعاده سفير البرازيل السيد باولو كورديرو بودعكم انا جوال حتى لقاءات اخرى والله معكم